I still don't know how the Bengals didn't win and cover that game. I don't know. I like it can't be, Todd. How did that happen? And you know, that makes two of us, and it's why this occupation is the ultimate definition of a true roller coaster ride. If you get too high or you get too low, the gambling gods have a way of trying to evening the scales. And last week de- defined a uh, another unique way to lose a football game with multiple double digit leads in the fourth. The Bengals trending towards kicking a field goal to go up six, which would have been perfect for all of us sitting at two and a half or better on the underdog. But lo and behold, they play for a 53 yard field goal. It goes awry, and the rest, as they say, is history and an L, unfortunately, by the hook. Unbelievable. Well, I'll tell you this. We'll start with the Bears as we always do, and there's some positive things happening finally with our beloved. And uh, for years, I mean, they were, first of all, they weren't favored a whole heck of a lot anyway. And when they were, it always felt like a, like a dead bet. But the Bears now, they got a couple of good streaks going here. They've actually held 11 straight opponents to 21 or fewer points. That's the longest such streak, a streak in the league. They've won eight straight at home. Technically, this is a home game, but uh, whatever. They're playing in London. But eight straight at home, seven and one against the number in those games. Since the start of last season, they're actually five, one and one against the spread as a favorite. So there's been a, a 180 reversal here. They're laying two and a half against the Jags. Look, the Jags are a lot better than the Panthers. Uh, the Panthers are downright awful. What do you feel, if anything, about Bears and Jags in this spot in London to kick off the action on Sunday? Yeah, Bears fans aren't going to be too happy. I like the Jags here plus the points because I just can't get to this number. You mentioned last week, Carmen, Carolina was down a number of starters on the defensive side of the ball. And credit to the Bears. They took full advantage of that. Caleb Williams put together a tremendous game, got DJ Moore involved, and we saw what uh, DeAndre Swift can do in the backfield. But anyone who makes the Jags a pick em or even an underdog, as this number suggests, against Carolina probably needs to tweak some of their power numbers out there. And I think when you look at the game here, you can sell bear stock kind of at the top of the market against an offense that's going to test them more than they've been tested over the last couple of weeks. And maybe even more so than what the Houston Texans were able to do, given how the Texans have really struggled to get out of their own way on the offensive side. And defensively, Jacksonville is good against the run. They leave a little bit, to say the least, to be desired against the pass. But the one thing the Jags can do that Carolina couldn't is bring pressure after a quarterback. You look at what Trayvon Walker's been able to do, Josh Hines, Allen as well. And I just can't get here to this particular number. I make the Jags minus one. You factor in the level of familiarity they have with their surroundings, making this trip annually. Uh, and I think the Jags find a way to knock off the Bears here, despite what we've seen out of Chicago over the last couple of weeks. Those edge rushers scare me. You said it. Uh, you're going to have talked about it this week. It is a whole different challenge than what Carolina could present, especially after Jadavian Clowney got knocked out of that game. The Bears have had some trouble on the edges, obviously. And those two scare me a little bit. So we'll see what uh, what happens. You know, on hey, one other one other thing on this game too. I know Bears fans probably aren't going to run to bet the Jags waking up at eight thirty in the morning on Sunday. Uh, there is a prop that we played in the game that I think uh, is worth a little bit as well. Christian Kirk under four and a half receptions should be widely available out there. I know it's a little bit early to move on some of those markets, uh, but you look at the way the Bears have defended the slot. I think this will be a little bit more of a tank. Bigsby game running the football. Evan Ingram getting back in the fold, hopefully recovering from the hamstring, means less work for Kirk. So I'll take him under four and a half reception. Sounds good. All right. The game I go to is Broncos Chargers in an over-under that looks like it's from the early 90s at 35 and a half. That's what's got (laughs) your uh, tickling your fancy Broncos Chargers. Broncos Chargers tickling my fancy 35 and a half. Yeah. The Broncos got a stu- stubborn, stubborn defense. Yes, they do. Stubborn defense. So I, I need some uh, I need some advice on are the Broncos for real here? <laughs> you know, Carm, you've been doing this with Yerk for a long time. If you're ever going to predict the games that he comes up with, that might be a sign that Yerk needs to retire. <laughs> that's true. So that's what he does. He keeps us on our toes when it comes to the NFL, EPL, <laughs> and everything else in front of us. But, Yerk, when you look at this game, my biggest concern with Denver is that I'm still having questions about this team's offensive capabilities. Uh, I know they put up some crooked numbers last week against the Raiders, but I think that was more a byproduct of a Raiders team being in disarray to a certain extent. And the Raiders had an opportunity uh, to really give themselves a comfortable margin early in that contest before a pick six swung it and it flipped the game on its head. I look at this Chargers team, and while there's plenty of questions they have to answer defensively, I do expect them to be much healthier for this game than the last time we saw them against the Chiefs. If they can get Joe Alt back along the offensive line, along with Rashawn Slater, Derwin James served his one-game suspension. Mm. And I think there's there's a reason there's a real battle on this game. Every time it gets to three, Denver creates a little bit of an appetite for the pros. But there's also another school of thought that this is where you can sell Denver kind of at the top of the market pricing and look to lay a shorter price for the Chargers. 
I'm not involved here, but I'm with you. I think both these teams have a lot of questions that have to be answered. Still don't know a heck of a lot about either side. Talking about all the games uh, this weekend with Todd Furman from the Bet the Board podcast. Get it wherever you get your pods. Make sure you follow Todd on X. He is at Todd Furman. Packers at home against the Cards laying four and a half or five. It's one of those sort of no man's land spreads. But uh, the Cardinals have been feisty. Uh, You got to appreciate that. They still have had trouble slowing opposing passing attacks. Bottom six and drop back EPA. Dead last and drop back success rate. When you think about what Jaden Reed has brought to the table for that Packer offense, Todd, Christian Watson may be coming back. I mean, I know he practiced. I don't know if he'll totally be ready or not. Uh, And Romeo Dobbs back from the one-game team-sanctioned suspension. Uh, Are the Packers going to do enough at home to be able to stretch their legs a little and beat the uh, beat uh, the Arizona Cardinals by a touchdown or more this weekend. Yeah, it always feels like Christian Watson is 50-50. It doesn't matter even if he's not on the injury report. We're not mm-hmm. sure if he's actually going to be out there. You know, an interesting trend when you look at this game, Kyler Murray has been outstanding in this kind of underdog role. 8-0 against the spread. His past eight starts as a dog of five-plus points on the road. 11-1-2 and in that role over the course of his career when he's catching more than five. It's happened twice this season. They ended up covering week one against the Bills and one outright last week, of course, against the 49ers. But I'm a little bit concerned about Arizona this week, given the fact that they got themselves down 23 to 10. And I think last week had a little bit more to do with San Francisco's inability to execute. Now, the one thing that's been interesting for Arizona, and I want to try and continue to pay attention to it, they've made some great adjustments defensively in the second half. They were able to pitch a shutout against the 49ers last week, but did something similar a few weeks ago against the Detroit Lions. It was just the commanders and their former head coach and Cliff Kingsbury that were able to have their way. You mentioned this number being a no man's land for good reason. You know, books love to try and let better steer this price and opening it in that five, five and a half range. We haven't gotten a six. We haven't gotten as low as four. What has surprised me a little bit, though, is the total getting touched up under from 49 and a half down to 47. Mm -hmm. If this number continued to trend down further, uh, I'd probably be forced into making a little bit of a value bet. I think both of these offenses can find success. The one disconcerting thing when you bet Packers totals over, as we saw last week, they love to be slow and methodical. There's nothing worse for an over better than when you take nine minutes off the clock and end up punting for midfield like they did in the fourth quarter versus the Rams. Uh, Texans go to New England to take on the Patriots. Uh, I don't know. It seems so easy for all of us on the outside to sometimes look at something and go, what are they thinking? It's a head scratcher. And these organizations do it anyway. The Patriots seem to be throwing Drake May to the Wolves here. Uh, I mean, David Andrews goes on IR. Their center last week allows the most pressures in a single game in four (laughs) years. I mean, that line is a mess. The offense is bad anyway. And you just go back and look at the tape of what the Texans did to a bad offensive line and a young rookie quarterback against our beloved Bears in week two. And aren't you asking, like, what the Patriots are doing this week? You know, when they made that announcement, I kind of dug through the Patriots' schedule and tried to figure out where there could be a logical landing spot for them to have potentially started Drake May. And the next couple of opponents for New England don't get to be any easier on paper. Maybe not until the Rams will they see a defense that I have in the bottom half of the league. So I think they kind of wanted to inspire the locker room. Now, I'm not sure seeing the face of your franchise lying on the turf against this Houston Texans pass rush is going to have that same kind of effect. But that hasn't stopped professional bettors from betting Drake May in his debut, especially with a total Mm. that has trended below 40 into that 37 and a half, 38 range. We saw a wave of sharp money come in this morning on the New England Patriots at plus seven. Still plenty of sevens out there. And I think what you're going to see is books finding themselves rooting for the Patriots to win outright, knowing that most folks will end up teasing Mm. or using the Houston Texans as part of a money line parlay. But for anybody that watched Houston last week, once Nico Collins left the game, their offense looked like it was stuck in quicksand. And C.J. Stroud just hasn't appeared to be the same quarterback this season, whether teams are scheming things up and he's getting a little bit confused by looks. I can understand why the Patriots are getting money in this game. Quite frankly, it's not for me. I will be a little bit more intrigued to look at an over-under at rushing yards for Drake May. I think his legs could be on full display, knowing that he provides a little bit more athleticism at the position than Jacoby Brissett does. One of the marquee matchups uh, along the belt, the Battle of the Beltway, Commanders, Ravens, big total here at 51.5. I guess you understand why uh, that Ravens defense not as formidable as we're used to seeing, actually outside the top 20 in EPA. The offenses have been exceptional. Uh, I, I love the stat that uh, Washington, I noticed, is like .097 expected points better than the second team in the league. That's Baltimore. And that's like equivalent to the disparity between Baltimore at two and San Francisco at eight. I mean, that's just how good this commander's offense has been. So do we see a shootout? Do we see something like we saw with Baltimore and Cincinnati last week? And has there been an appetite for the over in this game? 
You know, been pretty incredible to look at what Jaden Daniels has done and through just a limited sample size, because the last time we saw Cliff Kingsbury as a head coach calling plays in Arizona, we know the experiment didn't end all that well, ultimately leading to him being let go. But he's come back with a different sense of purpose. And you look at this Washington team that has really played on their front foot, one of the most aggressive teams in the league, eight for eight so far this year when they go for it on fourth down, something that's not going to be sustainable over the course of the full season. Yeah. But with a defensive head minded head coach, it does raise some eyebrows when you look at teams like the Baltimore Ravens in this spot and the Cincinnati Bengals in Sunday night games historically teams off an overtime game playing on normal rest against a team who didn't have to go to overtime the week before win their games about 43 percent of the time so mm. this would have set up quite perfectly for us to try and lay the points with the Ravens had the Ravens ended up losing that game last weekend against the Bengals. Instead, I'll find myself on the sidelines mm. from a side perspective. You mentioned the total. We did see some over money at 50 and a half. Number got as high as 53. Uh, and given that we've seen totals in the 50s consistently come in under so far this year, you can understand a little bit why there was some buyback at that number. And I think the big question is how Baltimore elects to go about moving the football on offense. They should have their full arsenal plays at their disposal. Last week, they were dynamic through the air, but you can run the ball against the commanders. I lean over the total at 51, and if I was getting involved in this game, that would be the closest I would get to a bet. I just can't get there on the side, uh, but should be arguably one of the most exciting and entertaining games to watch of the entire Sunday yeah, slate. Absolutely, and good nugget on the uh, the overtime trend there, too. Uh, a couple quick college things real quick. Uh, Red River at the Cotton Bowl. Uh, it always scares me if you, gotta, you start looking at a team like Texas, which I think metrically... Uh, no question better than Oklahoma, but in these rivalry games where you're asking a team in a neutral site to lay more than two touchdowns, uh, any thought on Oklahoma or are they just too inept offensively and uh, their young quarterback, let's face it, he hasn't even thrown 40 pass attempts. Now you ask him to do the Cotton Bowl and play uh, the number one team in the country. Is that just too tall of an order for the Sooners this weekend? You know, Texas favored by double digits over Oklahoma for the first time since 2005. Why is that year relevant? Well, that was the last time Texas won the national championship with Vince Young. So maybe a harbinger of things to come uh, for the burnt orange. But you mentioned Michael Hawkins, and I think it's going to be interesting to see what Oklahoma can do to play to his strengths coming in off the bye. The problem for OU is they are extremely banged up uh, at the pass catcher position. Nick Anderson hasn't really contributed at all. We saw Deion Burks get ruled out a little bit earlier today. He's been more of that possession receiver. And while I have plenty of questions about Texas, specifically in the back end, knowing that they haven't played a team that can throw the forward pass consistently just yet, Oklahoma doesn't fit that profile either. So when I look at this game, the first half total comes to mind. I think Oklahoma is going to do everything they can to muddy up the waters, try and make this thing a little bit more of a rock fight for Texas. If there's some rust from Quinn Ewers and we can dodge the Steve Sarkeesian script, I think we can get to half under what odds makers expect to be a little bit of a track meet right around 50 and a half, 51 first half under the only way that I would get involved here, okay. worry that the Sooners eventually run out of gas, knowing that they're a little bit limited offensively. All right. Good note. I'm going to ask you about one more and then you can give some best plays. Uh, Oregon, Ohio state, one of the marquee games of the weekend. It's weird to see Oregon and Outson in a night game as a field goal underdog, but that is the case here. Uh, look, Oregon barely got out of Dodge with the win in week two against Boise State and Ashton Gentry, a Gentry who's been phenomenal. And I, you know, you, you hope people start realizing it more. I mean, I know, especially for people in the Midwest and the East Coast, it sometimes can be hard to focus in on a player that's playing uh, at Boise State, but he's been phenomenal and he ran wild in that game. When you think about this Buckeye two headed monster, uh, are, are they going to be able to put it to the Ducks? A defense the way Genty did and is Ohio State the side here, even though going into Austin at night is a pretty tall order for most teams. You know, you mentioned the one data point we have for Oregon's defense, and it's not something that I would leave me brimming with confidence in terms of their inability to slow down Boise State, knowing Ohio State a little bit more dynamic in the pass catching room, and they can definitely offer the same punch in the backfield. When we look at Oregon offensively, they just haven't looked right for me. And I'm not sure if that's by design, given the caliber of opponents they face. And this is the great unveiling for what Dylan Gabriel can do to try and attack this Buckeyes defense that really hasn't been tested in their own right, even in two Big Ten games against Iowa and Michigan State. We've seen the underdog take some money, and that's part of the reason that the fours have been cleared out. And even the three and a halfs earlier today that we're down to a flat field goal. You know, this was a game that would have been Oregon minus one before the season started. Mm -hmm. So it shows and illustrates mm -hmm. a little bit of a shift in the power numbers over makes some sense. And that's probably the way that I would look. I know traditionally these big games have been all about defensive minded slugfest, but that's not the age we're in in college football. I think you have to be able to land the haymakers to keep up with your opponent. And I think both of these teams have a path to a little bit of offensive success. So over 53 and a half 
probably the strongest look I would have in that game. I love that. Any other best plays you want to give out for the weekend? You know, we'll go uh, back to one of the wells that was fruitful for us last week. Not a uh, best start to the season by any stretch, and I'm not one to sugarcoat it. But Nevada found a way to exceed Ozmaker's expectations coming up just short against San Jose State. I think they're undervalued again this week. Oregon State could potentially be without the, one of their leading backs in Jam Griffin and a little bit of a sandwich spot coming off a double overtime win against Colorado State playing UNLV next week. So I'll take the Wolfpack plus three and a half. Uh, we'll go to Morgantown, uh, and I ch- was going to try and make a case for the home underdog. N- number never popped to get to three and a half to get there in West Virginia. But I think both of these offenses, between the Mountaineers and Iowa State Cyclones, can uh, have some relative success against one another. West Virginia by ground, Iowa State through the air. So I'll go over the total of 53. I know it's not the best of it. You know, we saw some over money coming at 51. And then the Sunday nighter, I'm going to work under the assumption that we're not going to see Malik Neighbors out there for the Giants uh, and go under 48. When you look at this Giants team, they want to be methodical on the offensive side. They faced a a very diversified passing attack last week and held their own to a certain extent. Bengals defense going to be a little bit healthier. Uh, I think it's the first team to 24 that gets out of MetLife with a win. I know it's scary to play Bengals unders, but we finally reached a point where I'm starting to show a little bit of value to try and go under the total with them. Make sure you check out the podcast, the Bet the Board pod with Todd Furman and Payne Insider. Uh, Multiple shows a week during the football season for you, wherever you get your pods. Follow Todd on X. He is at Todd Furman. Thanks as always. Great stuff, buddy. Enjoy the weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Always a pleasure, gentlemen. Good luck at the window this weekend. You too. There's Todd Furman. We will take a quick break. We'll come back. Uh, We've got a few more things to kick around before crosstalk, and then the boys will be down at 2.35. It's Carmen in New York. We'll be right back.